This episode of Back to the Roots podcast is brought to you by Byron Seeds. The folks at Byron Seeds believe organic requires a different perspective, plan, and approach. Organic isn't simply a different type of product or even a different way of farming. It's a different way of thinking, planning, commitment. It's a different philosophy on how to feed the world. Many won't understand, but the people at Byron Seeds do. We're owned by organic dairy farmers. We not only have the product, but we plan, manage, and execute organic. We speak your language, we share your struggles, and we laud your successes. Organic isn't a way of doing business, it's a community. We learn from each other. We're in this together. We'd be glad to talk cropping plans, management systems, the road to profitability. We understand what you're trying to do. We're farmers just like you. Visit us at byronseeds.net or give us a call at 800-801-3596. And thanks to Byron Seeds. We are also brought to you by Soil Biotics. Soil Biotics Efficient is a fish emulsion-based liquid organic fertilizer concentrate, providing a rich source of nutrients that slowly break down and release nitrogen into the soil. It can be used in organic programs as a part of preseason and in-season growth programs. Efficient is an excellent food source for soil microbes. From pre-plant soil preparation to post-harvest soil maintenance, Soil Biotics organic products are formulated to work together to provide a continuous beneficial growth environment to meet all of your organic agricultural needs. For product details, visit SoilBiotics.com. Finally, we are brought to you by our newest sponsor, Elite Equine and Farm Supply. Elite Equine and Farm Supply strives to provide the equine world with the most innovative and highest quality health and wellness products on the market. Elite Equine offers the Equilume masks and stable light fixtures to horse breeders and performance horse trainers across the country. If you've been looking for top quality supplements for your horses, look no further. We have you covered with hemp supplements and the Tribute Equine Nutritions. Elite Equine also offers the most innovative horse blanket, which provides heat and massage therapy for your horse on demand. Elite Equine is located in the heart of Amish country, just a quarter mile north of Mount Hope, Ohio. Be sure to visit their website at EliteEquineAndFarmSupply.com or visit us on Facebook. And thanks to Elite Equine. You're listening to Back to the Roots Podcast. I'm Mike Klein, and along with Brian Wood, today we are joined by special guest Ty Lopez, who is an investor, entrepreneur, and has recently been buying farms, uh, about 800 acres of farmland, uh, to rejuvenate it using regenerative ag and organic agricultural methods. So, Ty, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me here. That's uh, good to be back to Ohio. I was just at your dad's. Mm-hmm. So... We were talking about planting alfalfa, oats, wheat, how to work soybeans into a rotation, because that's not really the traditional, you know. Were they growing soybeans when you were growing up? No. No. We didn't grow. They only started um, probably 10 years ago to yeah. every once in a while mix it in. Your dad seems to like soybeans. thinks yeah. it opens up the soil. and It does. We planted soybeans, and I just looked. I, I wasn't there, but a guy who works at one of my farms was plowing it, and when you plow after soybeans, it just plows nice. It just it, falls apart. It just falls, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's funny, that's not talked about that much because mm-hmm. I feel like people think of soybean, corn and soybeans as like a negative, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, all the mid. I went to, there's a county in Illinois, I forget the name right now, but it's supposedly the most fertile place almost in the world. And I went there and it's just this black soil, but that's all they grow, corn and soybeans, it's too bad. But I was looking at maybe investing in that. Have you been to central Illinois yeah. before? Like six feet of black dirt. Uh, it's just like, and flat. It's mm-hmm. like, I'm surprised there's not more Amish there. There's some like Arthur, mm-hmm. Illinois, but. Land's too expensive. too expensive. Not more expensive than Holmes <laughs> County though. <laughs> That's, That's why mean, people are leaving It's here. like 9,000 an acre for prime farmland. That's 
a hundred acre farm would be a million dollars. Whereas here it's going to be, what, what do we say? Uh, anywhere from 40 to 60,000 an acre. It's insane. It's crazy. It's like Lan- Lancaster, Pennsylvania was mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. Some of the Amish there have had trouble. And I looked at a farm and it was like a hundred acres. It was like 4.6 million. And now that was pre COVID. I bet you now that farm, think of all the people who want to leave New York city and come close, probably like $7 million, mm-hmm. 70,000 an acre, 80,000. So, mm-hmm. so I yeah. want to go back a little bit to that. You came to work on my dad's farm. We yeah. had just, we had gotten married and, uh, and it moved off the farm, but what made you want to come to an Amish farm to work Amish. for a summer? So I came here, I had been first at, uh, an Amish guy in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. His name was Daniel J. Stolzfus in Bird in Hand, an organic farm. So I had been at Joel Salatin's, and then I went from Joel Salatin's. I met this guy. A lot of Amish go to Joel's farm to, like, seminars and stuff. So this guy goes to the farm, and then I went to his farm. And I re- Well, I read a book, actually called Amish Society by, it's a professor, I forget his first name, but Hostetler. It's such a good book. And I was like, this is interesting. These people are, you know, doing it, living their way. I was just fascinated by that. So I went, took a bus. I didn't have much money. I took a Greyhound bus from North Carolina. Went to Jan, Daniel J. I'll never forget. He lived on a busy interstate. And you. I walked off there and it was like going back in time because all of a sudden, there's, oh, he had mules in the barn. He was feeding um, apple pomace because there's orchards around there. So he'd get all this free pomace and he was scooping it on a wagon with two mules attached to it to his dairy cows. And I remember just the first day being in culture shock. I went in his house. He's like, you can have this room upstairs. And I trying to flip on the light switch when I walk in the room, <laughs> you know, and I was like, wow, this is. So I stayed there. Um, and somehow I came upon your dad's. No, I went to, then I went to the more conservative Amish, the Nebraska Amish. They're like the white buggy mm-hmm. Amish in upstate Pennsylvania. And when I was there, um, this guy I was staying with, his name was Mark. What was his last name? He was, an, he was a guy who had joined the Amish, wasn't born Amish. Mark Oliver, I think was his name. He said, there's an interesting guy who writes all these books. And his name is David Klein. So I wrote your dad a letter. I'm pretty sure I wrote your dad a letter. I don't know if your dad was using a phone back then. Uh, we and had a phone like a, a phone? quarter mile down Bo- the road. Booth, yeah. yeah. But no voicemail. Yeah, no voicemail. So I wrote him a letter, and he said, come on by. And so I came by. And I, for, I, you know, I forget the exact details, but he let me stay in that little log house that you have behind the house. Mm-hmm. And. It was only your two sisters were there. Mm-hmm. You had, you had, I had just married, married and, and you were gone. Yeah. Time, and yep. Tim was, so that was my introduction. And what happened? I remember a cow kicked me in the toe. <laughs> I was walking barefoot from the other Amish all went barefoot. And then I went and worked on your dad's farm and I tried to walk, push between it like a little tie stall for the cow and she kicked back, kicked me in my toe. That's one thing I remember. <laughs> and no one was around, so I ended up crawling out of the barn. That toe, never break a toe. It stayed broken for years. It was really? weird. Yeah, it stayed broken for 10 years. So it was mostly good experience at your farm except that one. And what, mm-hmm. what brought you, what made you want to get more connected or what drove you to connect with the Amish at that time? I mean, I think... There's two things. I was I grew up not in the best childhood, so the Amish were very peaceful. I never been around peaceful families. You know, my dad was in prison when I was born. He was an alcoholic. My mom was a single mom, and she got remarried to my stepdad. But that was a chaotic marriage. So I honestly think, you know, as a teenager, I felt like I don't know. I was maybe you seek out the opposite of what you have. Plus, I was into agriculture. So the Amish were like a double good whammy, you know, they had peace and they had, they knew a lot about farming and your dad knew all extra lot. You know, your dad was, is like fascinated by nature. So 
that it was just a good and and i don't even know if it was fully some things just happened to you you know it's not fully planned so i was there i was trying to think how long i was there i was there for the summer your dad reminded me it was a super wet year rained all summer so weather patterns now this year you had a good year we had the best year that I can remember here. Yeah, I looked at corn. So in Virginia, I'm in the Shenandoah Valley, and it was the driest year. All the old timers around me, they're 90 year old farmers. They said this is the driest year ever. So we planted corn. We are my farms were running on a seven year rotation. We kind of do your dad's rotation, but we just extend it out mm-hmm. longer and sod. Um, and we plowed up some sod that's been in sod for. 100 years and we put corn in and it started out great and then it just stopped raining and it's pretty insane i mean it, it was dry it so here though it looks the opposite you got 10 foot corn in some of this bottom land mm-hmm. we have like five foot you know two years ago though it was good it, the weather is going all over the place two years ago was the wettest year in 100 years in the Shenandoah valley and this year is almost the driest wow. so I don't know if the climate people argue over where the climate change is real. Well, it's very localized. I mean, yeah. I live in Michigan, and you got little pockets that are have been dry and yeah. haven't grown a thing, and then you got others that are just perfect or yeah. flooded. <laughs> it's all across the is board within a little southern, region. Southern Michigan. Yep, yeah, yep, southern. Yep. Yep. That's pretty good farmland, isn't it? It really is. Yep. We got a lot of seed corn growers right where I live in southern Michigan, and yeah. that requires Amish some there good ground. Yep. Did mm-hmm. you grow up Amish? Or mm-hmm. No. No. Okay. No. I'm the counterbalance to Mike. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in the city somewhat and brought yeah. myself to agriculture later. Yeah, later. Yep. So it sounds You're like like me. Yeah. Not not far off. I but uh, that is my question. Is you know you your background entrepreneur right. and investor that's what yeah. people would know you as right. at, at this point in time um but you had this experience how did you use that in yeah. the world that seems like the exact opposite of agriculture you know yeah it, it seems very cutthroat at least looking at it from the outside it is and, more cutthroat although agriculture is more cutthroat than you think if you look at the forces behind it the forces behind commodities mm-hmm. and what's happening to dairy farm i was talking to your dad you know everybody stopped growing wheat your dad stopped growing wheat he mm-hmm. said 30 years ago and you used to be able to buy a farm with wheat mm-hmm. in the Shenandoah valley my neighbor some of those farms are pretty old they're 17 joel's house salatin's house was 1770 or 80 so the, wow. these farms are george washington owned my farm a long time ago it was all that original settlers owned that whole area and back in even the 40s a guy he said he said time my dad would buy a farm pay it off in three years growing wheat mm-hmm. three years you own the farm and now the world's gone where people sometimes never own their farm they keep leveraging and getting more and more mm-hmm. debt so that's why i said you know business in the city is cutthroat but in the countryside the the forces that are happening behind the scene are just as cutthroat you know mm-hmm. in terms of look at dairy you know which you know very well mm-hmm. if you're not organic now it's like look at meat processing in the united states america it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next six months with the supply chain planes aren't working boats aren't working nobody yeah. wants to work yeah nobody wants to work they're injecting money into the economy and people are like why would i work i live in puerto rico now and in puerto rico every time a stimulus check comes all the construction worker guys are like everybody quits because oh, like i have enough money for six months then they come back to them in six months when they're you know broke so yeah i think that i, I mean I think the big weak link is probably processing. You know, there's not enough meat processing facilities. We saw that for Farmer's Card at the beginning. We were selling all this meat, and then all of a sudden, people are like, we can't get you meat anymore because, you know, they shut down the processing facilities. And like you said, most Americans don't want to work at the processing facilities. Mm -hmm. So I I think food will be a big deal 
in the next 20 years. I think farmland will go up in value because it'll become like almost part of national security that you grow food. I mean, pre-COVID, some of the chicken vertically integrated guys, they would grow the chicken here, butcher it here, put it on a boat, frozen, whole chicken. China is where they'd cut it up and ship it back to America. I mean, that's insane. Just think that's of the crazy. fuel. Yeah, and so, but it was cheaper to do that. I think that's going to go away a little bit because of maybe rising tensions with China too, between America and China. Mm-hmm. So I think it'll be interesting to see what play. And America still generally, like I said, Illinois still has eight nine thousand dollar an acre farmland i was just in sweden the land's not as fertile as here and it's more expensive you know what's interesting you know how quick a farm sells how out what i don't know if you read this stat how how long do you think it takes the average farm in the u.s to sell not holmes county but just mm-hmm. like like from for sale to sold yeah exactly what do you think what's your guess a year I think it's longer it's like let's say three years if you look at all the u.s not homes because you got to remember some of u.s is rural farmland like here you have a homes county is unique because it's like a city that's rural <laughs> mm-hmm. you have all these people here if you go to some you get out in some parts of you know iowa and stuff like that but anyway and you see this in virginia too in sweden stuff sells in a week it's insane it's, it's like Holmes County, but everywhere. So I was there, but I was looking. I mean, America has better farmland. The best mm-hmm. thing about America, in my opinion, is not the government and all this where it's at. America has the most fertile land with good rainfall and temperature. Mm-hmm. And the sad part is we're killing it. Yeah, for sure. Sweden, we- though, is it's not just America that's killing it. Sweden is solid wheat. And now Denmark, by the way, it's illegal to not be organic. <laughs> so when you go to the grocery store, like to buy raspberries, blueberries, blackberries, all your produce, lettuce, they don't say organic on it. I was like, how come they're like, oh, it's or legal to not be organic. Mm-hmm. So they don't even have to label it anymore. Mm-hmm. So some countries like Denmark are doing a good job. But when I actually go out in the farmland, they just grow small grains there. It's insane. Mm-hmm. We, uh. we toured dairy farms in Denmark, and uh, like he grew barley and wheat for beer. That really? was organic beer that I thought was cool because everywhere you went, there was organic draft beer, huh. which was like, well, that's kind of cool. Yeah. But it's when it comes to dairy, they've got, they've got it kind of figured out in Sweden, Norway, and Denmark. Yeah. Um, lots of subsidies, of course. But, yes. But what they were do, they doing well that you liked? Well, they have they have certain amount of time that that cows have to be on pasture. Oh, right. Um, right, right. You know, so there are some animal care stuff that I yes. think they do really well. Yeah, they well. do. They're really strict on that yeah. stuff. Like um, you go to jail if you mishandle animals there. Mm-hmm. It's So you're saying American organic gets away with murder basically. No, no, not not at all. Um but when I look at the KFOs, the giant 20,000 cow yeah. operations, um, when you look at that, those cows are very, very well taken care of. Yeah. But in my opinion, they're not taken care of in the way that a cow should be should be taken right. care of. Right. They're not so, out on pasture. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm I'm all about the organic rule for pasture. What and, is the rule for these big, you know, in large industrial dairies that are organic? Do they can they get away? What's the percentage they need to be out on pasture? Well, it's dry matter intake of the cow. Okay. So that has to be 30% of their required feed yep. during the grazing season has to come from pasture. Okay. And 30%, when you really look at it, is not that hard to achieve. Yeah. Um, if you just graze your cows, let's say it's during the summer and it's really warm, and you just turn them out at night yes. for 12 hours, you'll probably be in the mid-50 percentile. Yeah of dry matter and so so it it there are bigger organic dairies that are definitely doing it right yeah but there's also i'm sure dairies that aren't doing it right yeah Um, that's where i think the integrity and the ethics involved in organic agriculture is so key yeah because you're always going to have bad apples 
What do you, what do you, what percentage of organic farms do you think are cheating in some form or fashion? Do you see it much? Have you seen it ever? I've seen it once in my life and I've been working. But you're here, Amish are much better ethics than in my experience in average society. They're still humans. Yeah. And they still like money. Yeah. So, but I'm saying, imagine yeah. you've seen, so you've only seen cheating once here. I've, I've seen it on, I've been working in the organic, mostly dairy industry now for, it'll be 10 years next month. Okay. And I've seen one instance. Yeah. Um, and that person is no longer certified and was terminated. And what all were that. they doing? Um, I don't want to get into specifics, but they but what were, was the big picture where they, was uh, it they were feed. They were feeding conventional feed to, oh, okay. To yeah. heifers. Yep. Um, So, you know, I'm sure it happens, Yeah. but the vast majority of farmers in the organic industry are legit. Yes. Um, But globally, I think it's an issue. Like Joel Salatin was telling me, some of this stuff coming out of Eastern Europe that says, I forget what the stat was. It was something like organic wheat or something coming out of Ukraine or something. I don't remember the country, but they were saying they produced this much organic wheat. And then somebody did the research, the entire organic wheat crop for the whole country. I mean, the entire organic and conventional wheat crop for that entire country was half of what they were selling. Mm -hmm. So they were like saying, yeah, we'll sell you, you know, 2 million, whatever, 2 billion metric tons of wheat or whatever the number, 2 million, let's just say. And the whole country only produces 1 million tons. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of lying going on. Mm -hmm. And... It makes and it's hard to tell when you look at food. You can't look at grass fed steak you're about to eat. I mean, maybe it has less marbling. Now <laughs> you sometimes can tell that way, but you certainly can't tell with bread you're eating. Mm-hmm. Well, you know? I, I think when you just for gra- for instance, grass fed. Yes. I think grass fed almost at this point is like the natural label. Right. There's absolutely like nothing down. behind it. Yes. Because if if you have a steer on grass. You can technically say they were grass fed, yes. But that's why when I look for grass fed beef, is is it a hundred percent grass fed? Right. Because a hundred percent grass fed means no grain ever. Yes. So I I think, I think the consumer is inundated with labels. Yes. And there are so many labels out there that yes. they get confused, yep. and then they will. Most consumers will revert back to what's cheap. Yeah. I think the future, honestly, one day they'll have the technology of putting the mineralization of the food. So, you know, not all carrots are the same. More important to me, I think organic is important in the sense that you don't want to be taking in pesticides, especially in certain things that concentrate pesticides in the fruit. But all organic carrots aren't the same. And that's why I said the ultimate thing is if, and they'll have this, I, I bet you in 20 years they'll have this. You could actually see like, I mean, there's things like the bricks index, although that's a little more sugar, but they'll actually be able to show the nutrient value mm-hmm. of this bunch of carrots versus that. And you'll, it'll be labeled that way. Most of the labels like now are useless because when you over label things, people first, they, like you said, they become generic. No one knows what they mean. They learn to cheat the system. You can say this steak, this cow was grass fed, but not grass finished. Which is how all cows have always been grass. Nobody's, <laughs> nobody's doing beef cows in a feedlot the whole life for the most part. All the cow cow calf operations are mostly grass fed mm-hmm. in America, especially in the South. You know, and so but take I'll, them up to weaning and then yeah. put them in that feedlot and just stuff yeah. them with corn. Or even, I mean, a lot of the way beef cows done is you have a stalker stage, and even at that stalker stage, is grass fed. Mm-hmm. It's once they hit time for after the stalker stage is where most of this american beef really hits the the feedlot but i'll tell you i think what i'm noticing what i find i have i have a big social media following so i can test ideas with large groups of people which is kind of you know there's pros and cons of having a large social media following in some ways it's better not to have a large social media following but the one interesting (laughs) thing from having a large social media following is you can test stuff on a lot of people and the food and farm literacy in America out of a hundred is like a one. Mm-hmm. For example, 
I see people bragging. I have a friend. They mean well, but they're bragging like, look, I have this um, dog food, and it's vegan dog food. And I'm going, this isn't something to brag about. You're basically talking about how you're starving your dog. I mean, dogs are definitely carnivores, (laughs) right? But that thought, people are so – I like the name of your podcast, Back to the Roots, you know, Back to the Farm, Back to the Soil – Which, by the way, is what I realized as a teenager, like when societies get too far away from the land, they just get in cuckoo land. Like I said, they start feeding. Oh, look, I feed my dog, you know, carrots. And I'm going, well, your dog looks horrible, (laughs) gains weight. It's kind of like humans if you give them too much carbs and not a balanced diet. But people, I had a a little debate on my Instagram because I posted a picture of one of my farms and this, this lady goes, you know nothing he's like you encourage people you know cooking food has ruined everything for people it's like and and she just had this make-believe theory about food and then she was saying i mean you can imagine and i was saying well it's not true that cooking food i mean some things are better to eat raw but some things are actually poisonous raw and when you cook them but People are so, I said to her, have you ever grown a garden? You know, of course not. This is like somebody. Mm -hmm. So what happens is people are living in glass towers in big cities, New York City, and they just read some wacky argument and they create these own, I call it delusions of their own mind. It's just, they build a story on top of a story on top of a story. So you see that with, there's a lot of eggs now labeled from chickens that don't eat um, meat, which if you know anything about chickens, if you have chickens outside, they're finding bugs. They mm-hmm. they they eat each other. Yeah, I mean chickens are not only omnivores; they're definitely prefer carnivore. You know, if you give them any kind of fish meal stuff like that, they go. But they'll also eat each other if they can. It's a big problem, and you know, in cannibalism. So I see these eggs that my friends cooking for breakfast, and I'm going, "Do you think this is good?" That it says that these are from chickens fed a vegan diet, but he has no, just the label, oh, it's a label there, it must be good. I'm like, that's, I actually purposely don't buy those eggs because I'm going, they're not gonna be nutrient dense Mm -hmm. if these chickens are somehow, they figure out a way to feed them just, you know, alfalfa or something like that. I think John Kempf had a really interesting take. He is hoping that eventually you will have a little laser pointer or whatever yes. that you can just point at a watermelon yes. and it'll show the nutrient density. Absolutely. He is convinced that yes. that is coming and that's where the regenerative egg, the organic egg, yes. now you're going to have to, if you, I still believe in the regenerative and the organic egg 100%, yes. but you're going to have to also come with yes. a nutrient dense yep. product, not just the organic or regenerative ag label yeah. on it. Which means farming by those principles. Absolutely. Yeah. Which, I mean, to be organic, the people who do it right, in order to pull off organic, you're definitely having to build the soil more. Mm-hmm. So you're already probably getting a new, better nutrient profile. The thing is, it should really, farmers should get paid by nutrients produced per acre. You know, it's like, what's actual, if you have an acre of cantaloupes, for sure there's wide variation and humans can even taste the difference i mean there's nothing worse than like a bad melon if you're connected enough with the to to know what it is yeah Yeah. well now people don't even eat raw food so most people they're drinking their you know they get their fruit in like some kind of super sugary pretend superfood thing that has like 60 grams of sugar you know so yeah you're right people are so but that's what I'm saying. The biggest yeah. thing, and I tell people on my social media, and it, it gets a better message now because of COVID. I'm like, some of you are entrepreneurs. You should buy a little farm somewhere in the world. Learn to grow your own food. If the world ever gets crazy, it's gr- even if the world never gets crazy enough that the grocery stores don't have food, you still sleep better at night knowing you a little bit know what you're doing. And and it, that message resonates 100% of people. I think it's deep-rooted in humans to be interested in the land. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But we've gotten so disconnected. So that disconnected. It's, it's so far away. And the hard part is that some of these ideas that come from the glass towers in the big cities, a lot of them then yep. fall back on the farmer. Yes. 
to do implement stuff that in some cases is better management. You know, I'm talking animal care type things. Yes. But some stuff is well, outlandish. Well, so I'm saying Sweden, as far as I can tell, is doing a better job on certain things. But I didn't see any mixed agriculture. I saw huge farms with wheat, maybe some horses. But we all know one of the things, and this one thing I learned from Joel Salatin, is a multi-species polyculture type mm-hmm. farm just is better on every metric, even productivity, you know? And so if you're planting wheat after wheat after wheat, even if you are organic, that's not really, Mm -hmm. which is I think what Sweden is doing. And I'm going, that's not the spirit of what this thing was supposed Mm -hmm. to be. The wheat was supposed to be in a rotation. There should be some animals on that ground putting, you know, that's where you get the microbial activity coming through the manure, through the urine. You take that off and you just have the, these monocultures. And so that that's probably going to be one of the big threats to organic farming is going to be just the monoculture organic farm. Mm-hmm. You know? Well, you know, when, it, when you look at corn, like in the organic system, you can't just raise corn. Right. Like you have to, there has to be a cover crop. Yep. Um, if you want to go from corn to second year corn, there has to be a cover crop in between. Yes. And very few certifiers would allow you to go third year corn. Yeah. Uh, because you've got to get that into a How long legume. do you can come back to corn? Would a year or two in year. between? Mm-hmm. But the thing, I remember, you, know, you ever heard of Alan Nation? Yeah. So mm-hmm. Alan Nation was the editor of a magazine called The Stockman Grass Farmer. And he was kind of a mentor like Joel Salatin, like your dad, when I was first learning about agriculture. And Alan Nation said, Ty, the science is in. That little kind of stuff, it's better than nothing, but it doesn't do much. Like if you plant corn and then you put a little cover crop or whatever, rye, oats, something that, triticale, something, it doesn't build sto- soil tilth. If you go in there and look in the spring, it, roots take a while. Mm-hmm. Well, back to the roots, your podcast, alfalfa, has a you know you know there's been 75 foot alfalfa roots 75 foot. 75 is like the record but in general alfalfa if you give it enough years goes let's say 8 to 15 feet mm-hmm. depending on the subsoil and weather mm-hmm. but you're not getting that with a cover crop no so alan nation's big thing is you have to have permanent kind of pulsed grazed or or mowed pasture in between and so organic like i said organic is certainly better but if you're planting corn and you put a little cover crop it's not long of a cover crop Mm -hmm. that's you're not by the time you take corn off depending on what you know whether it's for grain or for silage and you're doing this in the midwest it's pretty cold not that what are you going to plant that and then so you get a little bit of spring growth, but you got to plow again for corn, you know, or whatever they're doing, whether it's conventional or not. So, you know, and then they go one year into clover or one year into cover crops. That's still, Alan Nation always told me, you watch Ty, this Argentinians had this thing, which now, by the way, Argentina has gotten much worse, but Argentina was really leading the world and was one of the most fertile places in the world. And they had, two years of cash crop whatever it would be and then at five year to seven years of sod grazing Mm -hmm. and you know they were famous for the best beef came Mm -hmm. out of argentina Mm -hmm. uruguay too i've been there it's just all grass all sheep in uruguay and in cows and he's like that's what it really takes now what the amish have which is the old german way works pretty well too but you have hay for at least two years Mm -hmm. you know and really the wheat is kind of extra it's it's a grass that's not plowed like the wheat you under sow it with Mm -hmm. whatever clovers alfalfa timothy all that so amish really are almost getting three years untouched Mm -hmm. well and i think that's what is so important is having that animal Yes. in the system because yep. now you can you can raise your row crops for your cash crops or whatever yep. you want but now you've got that into pasture yep. and you've got that in hay so you might have that in four to five years in yes. in hay slash pasture yep. as you need it for your it's that closed loop system yes. that's how you build the soil yeah um and and i find it really hard to believe whether it's organic or not that you can build soil 
by yeah. raising corn and soybeans. Like, yeah. how, like if, you, if you are building soil, you are spending a lot of money to build that soil. And I'm just not sure there's and a way I don't to really do it. it. I don't, I don't, an Amish guy, Sam Chup, once told me, he's a very polite guy. He said, I heard him say to somebody, if you don't mind, I don't believe you. <laughs> it was said a very polite way of saying, I don't believe you, right? So I'm like, I don't. Now, beans grow the soil, but the, if you're doing it organic and you're cultivating, you know, I mean, conventional people argue, oh, yeah, we're just spraying it with Roundup. And so we're not having to till the soil. So the carbon's holding in. But you're killing everything else in the process. Yeah. And also, it's, it's getting in the water for humans. Mm-hmm. And, but more importantly, I think that you have to mimic nature. And one thing Joel Salton always told me was nature laughs last. So when society comes in and says, oh, okay, you know, we don't have to disrupt the soil, we can just spray it and then plant the same corn, beans, nowhere, you don't see, I mean, you do see monocultures in nature sometimes, pine forests in the South, for example, where I used to live in North Carolina, you'll have big, but it's never pure monoculture and even there you have that's more um it it depends on the time frame and the age and maturity of that stand through the that's a long kind of monoculture they're not annual monocultures Mm -hmm. it's annual monocultures that's different if you have like north carolina have like loblolly pines this one huge pine tree so you'll get but even then as the loblollies die off over 20 30 years it's replaced by an understory that's everything. I mean, in the South, you obviously, it's a lot of junkier trees or softer wood trees, but it's a huge variety that you see. And so it's not a perpetual monoculture, which is what we've turned a lot of the Midwest into. So whether it's organic or not, and if you're doing it organic, I mean, when we grow organic soybeans, you guys cultivate them? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're cultivating you don't want to be doing that year in year out. No. And organic, most of the organic, yeah, I just, so I think that also the cool thing about a long rotation is weed control. Absolutely. Because, you know, one of the kind of rules, it's not always true, but the weeds that survive in annual cropping, like in North Carolina, you have Johnson grass. This becomes a huge problem. Johnson grass, when you put it in a grazing rotation, the cows love it. Oh, yeah, it's great. And so it's gone. They eat it first. So basically by – so I think it's it's the problems in the large-scale organic world are you're still mimicking a lot of the annual monocropping, and that's problematic. And like you said, it's not just animal mix. You also need – and this is like the thing your dad's farm, you had – horses and cows and even the manure you spread that's a pure manure from cows a bedding pack it's not as good as if they're also getting horse manure pig or chicken you know we plant it we have this field this farm that i bought that was a little bit run down and we ran broilers over them in like pens pastured poultry and and we ran cows over it and we spread, you know, organic fertilizer and just that variety. It was pretty amazing to mm-hmm. see the transformation on a farm. And it wouldn't have just happened if you just had cows. The chickens is like you know, the fun, the holy grail is if you can get chickens on it because they work the soil kind of with their claws a little bit and they have pretty potent. And it's just a nutrient profile difference. Horse manure is much colder nitrogen wise than chicken Mm -hmm. we put when you put those broilers in those pen like portable pens you're dropping 300 units of nitrogen that's a lot you you won't get that see it after the first rain it's like you see the squares Mm -hmm. we've run like a a plane or a drone over it taking pictures you see the squares and um but you know an interesting thing and one thing i differ we differ a little bit from joel salatin joel salatin's like a no tillage guy Mm -hmm. So I always say I'm like a combination of Joel Salatin meets the Amish meets Allen Nation in Argentina. Like I've tried to like take the best. And I do think tillage helps because, for example, tillage actually helps with parasites and people don't realize that. So we, pro- we were growing 
broilers for Joel Salatin and ours grew even more than his same feed. And he says he thinks it's because it's new, fresh ground. So running broilers over the same pasture, even though he moves them all the time, Joel's like, I think you're getting a new ground boost. And what plowing does, it creates new ground without having to hold the farm for a hundred years. So if you have this long rotation and then you plow it up, you can, you know, build depth of soil. And I think the way Joel does it works, it just takes a long time. It takes a long time. So I think the way that the Amish kind of pioneered what, or it's really Germans were all doing this in the 17, 1600s, 1500s. If you can combine the best, I think that the organic movement would really thrive, you know. And we're starting to put produce instead of corn at the beginning. Do you know who Elliot Coleman is? I've heard the name. So he's kind of like the most famous organic gardener guy. He's written all these books. He's one of the best for sure. He's, you, you should interview Elliot Coleman. He oh. is an interesting guy. He's up in Maine. Elliot Coleman. I, I, I got to introduction through, and he said, I was like, where should you put produce in the rotation? Okay. And he's like, before the corn. Because <laughs> the only thing heavier feeder then corn is the produce produce some of this stuff's heavy feeders you know you want peak fertility there so what i'm kind of trying to pioneer in the long run is produce so heavy feeders first you know you just move down the progression but put and produce is so labor intensive if i like i have let's say let's say you have a 20 acre field i don't want to put 20 acres in produce that's a lot of produce so you split it so you got 10 acres of corn and 10 acres of produce or five acres of produce and 15 acres of corn and i was asking your dad today i was like where does soybeans go in the rotation and i think the obvious thing is right after the corn right Mm -hmm. the problem that we run if you put the soybeans so you got the corn and produce the problem is you pull those off especially produce i don't like to use plastic sometimes we use plastic we've tried to use some like regenerative plastic that like just disintegrates into the soil it didn't work it tore a lot um so what do you do when you pull that off in the fall now you got these bare rows in between or you could keep the plastic on the problem with putting a cover crop in which you could do and elliot coleman's really into that but he's pretty small he's like two acres and he's more like a greenhouse guy at scale i'm like all right if i put that in then i want to plow early for the corn let's say um i'm sorry yeah so on the part that was the produce what do we do there if we come into so we plant soybeans later right so i've thought of putting a cover crop in but it's got to be a cover crop in virginia that that's easy to kill to put in the especially if you're going to go into soybeans i don't want to have a whole mess right so here with oats winter kill right mm-hmm. but they don't in virginia so you have to be careful oh i see so there i'm trying to think it's like what's this i was talking to your dad i'm like what's the species that will what's our oats in like the south you're just cold you're a little you're a couple zones colder mm-hmm. than us in the usda kind of zone thing mm-hmm. so you know, farming's like a game. It's like a big puzzle. But like I said, I want to have the heavy feeders. Then you go, what I do is I split the field half soybeans, half oats. Because if I do pure field of soybeans, it pushes my rotation out longer and I have less years in sod. So I want to get my, I, I always tell my the team that runs my farm, I'm like, the stuff that takes, I want to only do for two years. So produce, corn, I mean, soybeans, not such a taker. Oats is not such a taker. But in the, I consider a taker anything I have to plow after it. Mm-hmm. So you got to plow after corn and produce or till. We have power harrows that we use, which work pretty. I don't know if you ever use those, but that is a cool tool. <laughs> like You can either have the ones that spin this way, like uh, horizontally, or they have vertical spading ones. But you could come after, for example the produce and not have to plow with that okay and it makes a seed bed that's just like um but it's hard on the soil you're releasing carbon you're like i mean the more the smaller you make the soil the more you've released 
So if I do that, because I got in corn and produce and pat in rotation one, and I get that off, I only want to have one more year like that. So that's why I put the soybeans in the oats. We have to cultivate soybeans, which is a little hard on the soil. Have you tried no-tilling soybeans into rye? I know, but do you like crimping them? Is that yeah, how you're they're, doing it? Does they're it using work? A, it, well, like five miles from here, you should yeah. see the soybeans. They are unbelievable. And, and they, they crimped are clean. it into rye? They rolled it down with a roller that kind of crimped it down and right. then just plant it right into that. So Fif- basically you come out of your corn and they're using like grain rye. It's not yeah. rye grass. No, it's grain rye. Yeah. And you need to let it get high enough yes. so when it gets crimped yes. that it does not keep growing again. My so. problem with that, and this is the counter argument to that, where we are is a little drier. Mm-hmm. And rye rye that's healthily growing in May. Let's say we plant soybeans the last week of May and early June, right? Rye sucks water out of the soil like you've never seen. Mm-hmm. So if we happen to be having a dry spring and you crimp that down, psh- I don't know if it would work, but oh. here you get a... What's your rainfall here? Oh, boy. I don't even know. Like 38 inches. It's. it's I thought it might be in the 40s. Yeah, 40s. See, the Shenandoah Valley, which was called the breadbasket of the Confederacy, because it could grow good wheat, because it got dry summers. So it's like all this farm stuff, you have to a little bit tweak it to mm-hmm. where you live. You know what I mean? So that I would love to do that. I if Rye is one of those ones that... I get afraid of because rye done wrong is like yeah. is like just takes over in it. I think Jerry D. Miller had the best saying on rye. He said, "If you go out in the field and there's one head of rye, yes. by the time you're done harnessing the horses, it's in full yes. head." <laughs> yeah, but I want to come back on the show and I'm going to let you know the results of my tests. I would so far, the tests are. It's funny. I bought this farm and the. You got some John Deere stuff, and the guy was, somebody said, oh, this guy from California bought a farm. Somebody said a mafia guy. <laughs> I don't know how. It's like it was like an old time community. But this guy, like, was like, oh, and then he came out of the farm. He's like, oh, he's like, have you ever done anything about farming before? Because this looks a little more like an actual farm than I thought. <laughs> and I said, well, I learned from David Klein. How about that? That's what I. That's what I could tell him. Right. But we've been experimenting a lot. I want to experiment with tons of stuff. I, one of the things I want to experiment with is we have so much fescue. And I, I'm not a, I'm a big fan. I was talking to your dad about this. Legumes change the world. Mm-hmm. And that's, we've gotten too much away from that in regenerative agriculture. And grass is great, but grass already grows in Virginia. So the hillsides, it's tough to plow. I was talking to, who was I talking to? Who's the guy that does all the soil test stuff? Uh, the two, mm, anyway, I did a soil test, but I, he's a pretty genius guy. And I was like, what if I come with that power harrow on the hillsides, okay, in the spring? Because I want to get it into improved red red clover. Alfalfa's tough on the lower mm-hmm. fertility stuff, but red clover and white clover and just seed it pure legume mostly legumes maybe it's a little chicory or timothy but because the fescue is going to pop in in two years in Mm -hmm. virginia Mm -hmm. and so i was like if i power hair it the main thing is that fescue is tough the good thing about corn is you shade it out you know you don't have as much fescue here you have some yeah. But not like the South has. No. We have that endophyte infected stuff that does The work. old Kentucky 31 that you oh, simply yeah. can't kill. Yeah, but so I said, I'm going to power harrow this and plant, like drill in like a small grain, grazing corn, sorghum, sudex. But like not on rows or like broadcast and just, and just see if I can't get, then I can graze it. And then that'll drown out the fescue for a year because that mm-hmm. Sudex stuff can grow, mm-hmm. you know. And it doesn't take much moisture. Exactly. As I said, sorghum, Sudex, all that Sudex kind of stuff, millet, something like that. And then I'll come in, kill it in the fall, and put it in back into pure clover. So that's like one of my experiments. Because if you can pull that off in Virginia, nobody's ever really done that. Because you can't, but you can't plow it. Mm-hmm. That's the problem. If you plow those hillsides. Even mm-hmm. we have switch plows and hillsides. It's still, it doesn't even plow that good. 
and the th- soil's thin. But that power hair, I can come in and just hit the mm-hmm. three inches, you know. So when I come back, I hope to. I'll tell you whether yeah. this idea actually worked. Yeah. Well, and if, and if it didn't work, you won't mention it. And if it I worked. won't, I'll do it on the back <laughs> of the farm. No, actually, I like to tell. It's good to talk yeah. about the stuff that doesn't work. Mm-hmm. And, Yep. saves other people and usually things don't completely fail maybe you just did it wrong maybe you had the wrong you know i, I think yeah. sometimes farmers learn more from other farmers mistakes than their successes yeah, exactly i agree and 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 also like i said um usually it's we often write off our mistakes as full mistakes and they're usually just partial mistakes Mm -hmm. like i said you try this experiment maybe the problem is i power harrowed in april 1st and i should have waited till the fescue got up may 1st and whack it back or maybe i should have run the hair over twice or things like that Mm -hmm. so i think humans and farmers are humans just Mm -hmm. you often i i've usually it's very rare that adults make as big a mistakes as we think sometimes we're too hard on ourselves you know you're like oh i made the biggest mistake and then if you think about it it's more nuanced it's like no most of the ideal was right just like 20 percent of it was wrong you know but you want to just focus on that 20 percent. yeah exactly the human brain you got to train your brain Mm -hmm. to be a realist not optimist then you only look at the 80 (laughs) percent not a pessimist then you only look at the 20 that went wrong but like a realist absorbs it all and goes, okay, this is what I did good. I only got to tweak one thing and it'll work next year. And the interesting thing about farming is you try this one year, then you've got to wait a whole year to think, yes. to do what you, I'm pretty sure I know yeah. where I screwed up, so I'm yep. going to do it. So then you wait another year yeah. to. So. But you know what? That's a good trait. In business, my business partner, I always tell him, you need a farm because he's too impatient. And impatience can lose you a lot of money. In fact, Warren Buffett, the billionaire, says the stock market is a clever device that moves money from the impatient to the patient. That's like my favorite quote right now. Yeah, but that's also true about farming. Mm -hmm. People who are like, oh, I got to wait a whole year. I'm like, a year will be here real soon. Time Mm -hmm. flies once you're over 18 years old. You start going, wait a second. No kidding. When you're eight years old, I remember my mom would be like, you're you're." You have to stay in your room for 20 minutes as punishment. And I'd be in that room and like 20 minutes felt like two years, you know. (laughs) Now somebody's like, Ty, you have to be by yourself for 20 minutes. I'm like, yes, I'm so excited. Get some free time. (laughs) Well, good. Uh, The the fun part here is that, you know, you took your lessons as a teenager and now you're starting to apply them. There you go. Now. And it's a humbling experience. It is. But you're learning every day, right? And that's what, that's a good thing about farm. In business, you can get a big head. Can't get a big head on a farm. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. old Mother Nature will that's right. push, put you right the back. The best in your farmer farm. in the world still every year makes mistakes. Yep. yep. Business is a little more, you know, where people get big heads because they succeed year in, year out. Well, but, even in farming, you can do everything exactly as yeah. you should. And Mother Nature will say, no, 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 no. That's right. Well, we really appreciate the time, Ty, and we'll hope to have you back Hopefully on. More yep. time next time. Yep. No, thanks Thank a lot. Thank you so much. Good. I appreciate it. No, thank you.